If you're here, then you've probably been asking yourself this for a while. What should I buy for my first metal lathe? What size should I get? Where can I get one? Can I really use it for time travel? My answer is yes. That doesn't make sense. Any lathe is better than no lathe. Oh, you're right. A lathe can be used for making a lot more than you'd think. The very first thing that I made on my lathe were these marshmallow looking pads to go on a Christmas tree stand to stabilize the Christmas tree. One of the next things I made were some plastic bushings to space off some track lighting in our living room. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I could just make these on a 3D printer, but in the time it would take me to lay out the design, get the printer set up, and make the prints, these parts would already be done on the lathe. Let's start by looking at buying a mini lathe. An import mini lathe can be purchased from anywhere between 450 to $1,000. They normally come in sizes like 7x10, 7x12, 7x14, 7x16, etc. Where the first number will represent the diameter of work that you can hold. And the second number is going to represent the length of the part. Now, in theory, those are the numbers, but there's actually some limitations that are gonna keep you from being able to turn work of that diameter and length, and I'll get to those in a minute. Mini lathes have a cult following with sites like Little Machine Shop offering a lot of upgrade parts like digital readouts, four jaw chucks, tool post grinders, steady rests, and much more. Most of the import mini lathes that you'll come across start their life being cast in the same factory by a company called C but have then been reworked, rebranded, and repainted, all to meet a particular vendor's specifications. This is one of the cases where a higher price might actually mean getting a better product. One of the drawbacks you'll have with a mini lathe is you're not gonna have the ability to remove a lot of material in a short period of time in something like steel. If you're turning plastics, brass, or aluminum, this lathe will be just fine. Another limitation you'll run into is bed length. Even with a 16 inch lathe, you're not gonna have the ability to work on a 16 inch long part. The 16 inch length doesn't account for the chuck, the drill chuck that you may have in the tailstock or the length of the twist drill. If you plan on only turning small parts like plastic and metal bushings or custom Lego figureheads, then you should be good to go. The next option that we'll take a look at is the option that I went with and what you can see right behind me, and that's a vintage lathe. I went with a nine inch by 48 inch South Bend lathe. And if you look up the serial number online, this lathe was made in 1931. That is absolutely crazy to me. This lathe is 91 years old. I'm an old man, I'm confused. I had mentioned in another video that I thought it was from the mid fifties, but apparently I was wrong. According to this tag, it was originally sold by Delta Equipment in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which would make sense because I got this lathe off Craigslist in a small suburb right outside the city of brotherly love. I think I paid around $1,100 for it, which kind of seems like a lot for an almost century old hunk of vintage machinery, but it came with a bunch of extras that I was able to sell to recoup some of my investment. Although all of what it came with was vintage tooling, there is a good market for this stuff on eBay. So I got rid of anything that I didn't think I was gonna need. You also have the option of other vintage lathes like Craftsman or Atlas, but I wasn't having any luck finding any of those in my area. I searched Craigslist periodically for a few years, looking for lathes in the four to $500 range, but everything that popped up was either too rusty and too far gone or sold by the time I was able to get to it. A couple of great places to look for a vintage lathe are auctions and estate sales. For estate sales, I use estatesales.net and I've seen more than a few lathes and bought plenty of tooling. I've also seen a lot of creepy dolls and creepy doll heads, but I didn't buy any of those. For auctions, I use an online auction site called bidspotter.com. I saw a lot more equipment and machines for sale up in the Northeast than I do down here in the Sunshine State. I bought my Dayton belt and disc sander at an auction in New Jersey, and I've also bought a lot of tooling at other various auctions as well. Now, I knew absolutely nothing about machining when I got my lathe, so to get started, I watched the 1941 instructional video, How to Run a Lathe, by South Bend Lathe Works. You know it's gonna be a good video when the lathe operator rolls up the sleeves of his dress shirt and there isn't a pair of safety glasses anywhere in sight. 
The young man with loose, dangling sleeves and flowing tie has no place in the shop. Tie should be removed and sleeves should be rolled up. Not only did it teach me the basic principles of how to use a lathe, but it taught me some important things about my lathe, like how to engage and disengage the back gear. To arrange the lathe for direct belt drive, the back gear lever is pushed as far to the rear of the lathe as it will go. The bull gear lock pin is pulled out and then up. The cone pulley is revolved slowly by hand until the bull gear lock slides into place, fixing the cone pulley to the spindle. I also binge watched videos from Mr. P, A-Bomb79, and one of the first machinists I came across by the name of Halligan. The last option that I'm gonna talk about are the larger import lathes, often referred to as a benchtop lathe. These are a great option if you really wanna get serious about machining and if your budget allows for it. A new benchtop lathe is probably my next move unless I can make a CNC lathe happen. So if you go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button, you can get me one step closer to that goal. There are some very reasonably priced bench lathes out there by Jet, Grizzly, Dayton, Bailey, and more. These lathes come out of the box pretty much ready to go where all you need to do is add a quick change tool post and you'll be up and making no parts. No parts? Parts in no time. They range anywhere between $1,500 and upwards of $4,000, but sometimes you can get lucky and find a used one for sale on your local marketplace. The benefits that you'll get from a higher end bench shop lathe are ground and hardened ways, a 50 to 2000 RPM variable speed, one horsepower motor, and things like a three draw and a four draw chuck will be included already from the start. No matter which lathe option you go with, be prepared to invest another chunk of change into your tooling. With companies like Shars making affordable tooling options, you can build your collection slowly and buy tooling as you need it to get through a specific job. I've also found eBay and Amazon to be a great source of buying tooling at a reasonable cost. Whatever lathe you decide to buy, just always remember to treat it with respect. Now you respect me because I'm a threat. Wear your safety glasses, keep focused, pay attention, and always try to keep your hands as far away from the spinny bits as possible. There's no right or wrong lathe. Whatever fits into your budget and whatever fits into your space constraints is the right lathe for you right now. If you want to get into machining with something like an import mini lathe, the resale value on them is good because there's always someone just like you like me out there looking to get their first lathe. The same thing goes with vintage and bench top lathes. With a bit of time and practice, you can very easily be taking on some really cool projects, kind of like this Frankenstein Milwaukee impact driver that you can watch me build by clicking this video right over here.